The growth juggernaut that is chip giant AMD continues to roll right along. Powered by market share gains and leading chip technology that is securing higher prices, AMD saw second quarter sales surge 99% from a year ago. Operating profits skyrocketed 380% from last year. The company also hiked its full year sales and gross margin outlooks. Joining me for more now on the company is AMD CEO, Dr. Lisa Su. Lisa, always good to speak with you here. So you said in the earnings release, your company is growing faster than the market. Break that, break that down. Why is that happening? Yeah, absolutely. Brian, um, great to see you. Good to be with you guys this morning. And, uh, you know, we had a very strong second quarter. Uh, I think what we're seeing is just very strong customer uh, customer demand overall in the market across um, our computing segments, whether that be, you know, PCs, gaming, and data center. And on top of that, we're seeing a strong customer preference for um, AMD products. So we're excited about that. I mean, we had a very strong second quarter uh, with uh, significant growth, and we were able to also uh, guide up for the full year. So, um, you know, we, we were quite uh, pleased with that. Can these types of growth rates for an AMD continue? Well, I, you know, I will say that, you know, when we started the year, uh, we thought we were, were, were going to grow significantly. So when we started the year, we thought we would grow 37%, which, um, you know, I thought was a good number. But what we found is as we've gone through the year, a couple of things, right? One is, um, as I said, the demand for computing is just exploding everywhere. I think, you know, whether it's um, in PCs where you're working from home, schooling from home, or now returning to office, um, you know, people want, um, you know, uh, better devices, or uh, particularly in the data center, uh, where there's just this um, incredible need for, uh, you know, more capability, um, all of the collaboration that we're doing, and, and all of the, you know, business intelligence. So I think that's strong underlying demand. And then on top of that, you know, we continue with um, great products. And in this market, it really is about the products, and that's what we've been focused on. So we're, we're very pleased with the growth. Uh, we were um, happy that we could upgrade um, our uh, growth um, estimates as we've gone through the year, and that says a lot about uh, the portfolio. There have been some concerns about PC demand slowing, I would suppose, as, as we all go back to the office and go back to our pre-pandemic lives, but it doesn't sound like you're seeing that. Well, you know, I would first say, um, you know, last year was a very strong year for uh, for PCs um, in terms of growth. This year is also a very strong year in terms of PCs for growth. Now, there are, you know, some, um, you know, supply chain issues that um, the entire market is working through. Um, I think we have navigated through those well, and we continue to, um, you know, work with all of our uh, customers, OEM partners, as well as the supply chain to do that. Uh, but we are seeing very strong end user demand. And at the end of the day, um, that's what you want to do, right? Provide new devices to people who um, are really wanting more capability. Lisa, you really had the, the comment of, of the earnings season, at least so far for me. You said on the conference call, you are fighting for every socket. How competitive is it right now in the chip space? Well, I think computing is just a very, very competitive market. I mean, you know, we are all about pushing the bleeding edge of performance. Uh, we make these decisions on what we're going to put in our products, you know, really like three to five years in advance. And so, yeah, it's extremely competitive. Um, that being the case, it's always been competitive. I don't think it's any different today than it was before. Um, it's always been competitive. It's all about putting um, a strong roadmap together. And we've been making these investments um, for a number of years. And we're very excited, not just about you know, the products that were, um, were, are in market this year, because, you know, we have some great products in market this year, but we're also very excited about what we have in the future and, you know, how we're taking advantage of latest generation uh, process technology and new architectures, you know, our, uh, you know, big CPU uh, product launch next year will be Zen 4, which is in five nanometer technology. So yeah, this is all about pushing the bleeding edge. And, you know, that's what we do at AMD. Take us through that product roadmap for 2022. How will the chips next year that you're coming out with, how will they be different versus this year in terms of performance and will they be sold at higher prices? Well, um, you know, this year um, our products are primarily on seven nanometer technology, and uh, you know we have our, our CPUs, our Ryzen CPUs, our um, you know um, Epic server CPUs, as well as our uh, you know new graphics and gaming cards, and those are all in seven nanometer technology. As we go into next year, we're going to launch our uh, next set of products, uh, which are you know upgraded in architecture, upgraded in design, and we will also be upgrading um, our CPU lineup um, into five nanometer technology, particularly in the data center. 
center. And the data center is all about performance. It's all about performance. It's about total cost of ownership. It's being able to do more in the same footprint. And so uh, we're excited about what um, that means for us. Um, you know, obviously there's a, it is a very competitive market, but you know, we believe that um, you know, we're at leadership today and we intend to keep that leadership going forward. Give us some good news here, Lisa. We've been talking about it all morning long, the chip shortage, it continues. Is there any light at the end of the tunnel that this will in fact end sometime in our lifetimes? <laughs> <laughs> well, Brian, what I can say for sure is that the entire semiconductor industry has been you know, working hard over the last couple of quarters uh, to ramp up production. I mean, the, you know, the demand has been through the roof. Um, we've been putting a lot of capacity. We've been working with our, um, with our primary partners to really optimize that capacity. Um, we have seen improvements in the supply chain. That's one of the reasons we were able to exceed our second quarter uh, results as well as guide up for the full year. Um, I think it's still tight as we go through this year, but I think as you've heard, um, there are improvements. You know, We're improving every quarter. We're, we're shipping more product every quarter. And as we go through the end of this year and certainly into next year, I think things will, um, you know, will improve. One company you are shipping product to is Tesla. So you have uh, struck a partnership, you're working with them, you're putting chips inside their infotainment systems. Elon Musk said this week uh, on his earnings call, he can't get enough chips. Is there an opportunity for AMD to gain more share of Tesla's business? Well, we're super excited about uh, the partnership with Tesla. I think it's an example of where uh, you know we have leading edge technology and there's a need for some of this consumer technology to really cross over into um, other markets. So, you know, the idea that you can do AAA gaming, um, you know, on the road, I think is uh, very exciting. So we're uh, very pleased to be in the uh, the updated Model S and Model X. And we do believe this is a growth driver for us, um, you know, as we go forward. So, uh, you know, it's an exciting area for us. Lisa, perhaps we could, you can give us a 20,000 foot view here. We're focusing a lot of jo on jobs uh, in America right now and, and how they might come back or, or in some industries, why they may not come back. Are you having difficulty hiring the, the tech uh, experienced folks that you need to service uh, the demand really that is off the charts for your company? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're all about our people and, you know, our engineers are really the, the foundation of how we, uh, you know, build on those next generation products. Um, I will say that um, I'm extremely pleased with um, how we're able to recruit. Uh, you know, we've been hiring thousands of people each year as we ramp up our R&D capability. And, um, you, know, it's, you know, it's always a competitive market for labor as well, but I do believe we have um, a lot of great engineers and people want to be part of an exciting story. And so, you know, what we say is, um, you know, we have um, a ton to do and a ton to learn at AMD. And so we have been able to uh, you know, recruit just great people. Is there a difference between hiring in the U.S. as opposed to overseas? Well, I, I think we, we we have a global company, so we hire um, across the globe. But you know, hiring the U.S. is you know very important. We do a lot of our um, our key um, you know architecture and designs uh, here, and so um, yes, I think the, the focus here is on making sure that we have skilled uh, a skilled labor force, and we hire both you know new college grads as well as um, experienced uh, employees that um, that want to be in the computing field. All right, leave it there. AMD CEO Dr. Lisa Sue, good to see you fighting for every socket. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Diageo shares are on the move after the spirits and beer maker beat analyst sales growth for its just ended fiscal year. Organic sales rose 16% compared to analyst forecast for 13% growth. As Diageo saw strength in everything from Don Julio tequila in the U.S. to Bailey's in Europe as bars slowly started to reopen. The company forecasts sales momentum continuing into its new fiscal year, along with improvement in operating margins. Joining me now for a look into Diageo is CEO Ivan Menezes. Ivan, good to see you this morning here. Uh, I don't think a lot of folks uh, appreciate how global your business really is. Let's start in North America. What's the state of the recovery here in the, your North America business? Uh, good morning. Uh, the recovery has been very strong. You know, when we went into the pandemic, the Audio North America business was performing well. Uh, we, we had good momentum. And then through the last 16 months, uh, we pivoted very quickly to uh, uh, some terrific marketing, innovation, execution against where the consumer shifted to. And coming through that, uh, our business has accelerated. In these results, in the, in the U.S. spirits business has grown 24%. Uh, 
uh, Casamigos business has more than doubled. Don Julio has grown nearly 70%. Even a brand like Bailey's in the US grew 31%. Uh, we're taking market share, uh, steadily growing market share, and the business is premiumizing. In Diageo's global results, where we grew 16%, the top 25% of our business, the higher price points, like Johnny Walker Blue and Don Julio 1942, those products grew 36%. So uh, two trends at work in the US and actually around the world. Spirits gaining from beer and wine. Uh, in the lockdown, people discovered their inner mixologist. And rather than reaching out for that boring glass of white wine <laughs> or insipid bottle of beer, they discovered uh, a Don Julio Paloma, a bullet to Manhattan, or, uh, or Johnny Walker on the rocks. And those habits uh, will stick because once you discover the finer things in life, mm -hmm. uh, you don't go back. <laughs> and so I'm feeling very good about the momentum here. Our team is executing really well. We've stepped up our marketing investment significantly. Uh, in these numbers where sales grew 16%, our marketing investment grew 23%. Mm -hmm. uh, in the US, it was even stronger. And uh, uh, the conditions of people drinking better and moving away from uh, uh, wine and beer to spirits, mm -hmm. we believe will continue. Yeah, forget that boring white table wine, Ivan. Sign me up for some Don Julio. Uh, but do you believe your business is taking market share away from the hard seltzer industry? We have been getting a, a drumbeat of bad news from many companies playing in the, in the hard seltzer market of late. Are you taking share from them? Well, we look at the total beverage alcohol market in the U.S. And Diageo is only a seven share player in that market. It's very important to remember we still have only a small share of that market. We do participate in ready-to-drink products and seltzers. It's a smaller part of our business. The trend we see sustaining is one of convenience. Uh, consumers in America are looking for high-quality drinks uh, from strong brands in single-serve, convenient, and ready-to-serve formats. We believe that's a growth engine. And uh, we participate in it through seltzers under Smirnoff. We have a, li a line of full-flavored malt beverages. And what I'm most excited about is the spirits-based cocktail single serves that we've now introduced in the U.S. Uh, Crown Royal has a lineup. Tanqueray is in. Kettle One Vodka uh, has a spritz. Those are doing really well. They're growing market share. It's still relatively small. Uh, but again, most of that growth is coming from beer and wine. Our premium spirits business is still growing very strongly. So convenience is the factor that's driving. And Seltzer did have astonishing growth. It had a lot of competitive entry. You, you are seeing some natural slowdown there. Uh, but the overall consumer state of wanting convenient, high-quality drinks in single-serve formats, we... Uh, uh, I think will keep growing. One spirits or, or several spirits that stood out to me in, in your earnings release, I mean, Casamigos, that is the uh, the George Clooney brand, tequila brand you brought sell, bought several years ago for about a billion dollars. That organic sales uh, in the year up 125%. Don Julio, another tequila brand that you own, up 68%. Why are you seeing so much strength in that particular market? The tequila uh, sector category has got very good dynamics that are supporting the growth. Uh, it is uh, cuts across consumer uh, demographics, uh, you know, multicultural, age, gender. It cuts across occasions and day parts. So in the old days, tequila was largely about the shots and the margarita. If you look at the drinks repertoire now with tequila, it's much wider. Uh, fine tequilas on the rocks or with soda, the Paloma, the classic cocktails with tequila, old fashions and the like. Uh, so that's happening. And uh, uh, agave has a very positive association with the American consumer. Uh, so uh, we believe that there's very attractive growth going ahead. Now we are growing twice as fast as the market. And the top end of the market is which what's got the fastest growth. You know, that's where Casamigos and Don Julio plays. Uh, 
but uh, we expect tequila trends to continue. It's about 20% of our business in the US. It's about 8% of our global business now. And it's very fast growing. And, uh, we, and we, we have trouble keeping up. You know, you, you know, that Don Julio 1942, go out and buy it. We don't have enough right now <laughs> because the demand is so strong. How are, uh, you know, there is a, it is a different story a little bit uh, over in Europe. How are the, the lack of travel, how is the lack of travel uh, and restrictions, just continued indoor restrictions impacting your, your European business? So what we're seeing in Europe uh, is the gradual opening of the on-premise is very positive for us because unlike the U.S., where I'd say four out of five drinks in America is consumed at home, roughly speaking, and in Europe it's about 50 to 60 percent is at home, uh, one in two at home and one in two out of home. So the, the pandemic uh, lockdowns of the on-trade and hospitality uh, hit us more severely in Europe. But as it's opening up, and the UK is opened up, Ireland is just opening up, the continent is also opening up, we're seeing the recovery come back uh, uh, fast, just like in the US. Uh, because people's desire to socialize outside the home, be it at bars or restaurants or sporting events and festivals, is very strong. Mm -hmm. And their desire to spend on uh, higher quality premium brands in these events, we're seeing it happen pretty much across the world as conditions improve. So one of our big brands in Europe is Guinness, which has largely consumed draft Guinness in pubs uh, in the UK and Ireland. As the pubs reopen, uh, uh, we see Guinness coming back very strongly. So uh, I, I expect uh, this to improvement to continue, but clearly we're not out of the, the pandemic, the virus volatility that's still out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but as conditions improve, uh, uh, we see the out of home market recover very quickly. Speaking of spending, you know, I mentioned Casamigos that you bought, I believe, in, in 2017. You also came out in 2020 and bought Ryan Reynolds Aviation Gin. What else is on your radar screen in terms of acquisitions? Well, we're keen to buy more. Uh, we have a strong balance sheet. The company and the year we just finished was a record year of cash flow. We, we had three billion pounds of free cash flow. Uh, but we're looking for quality brands, premium quality brands that have a long runway for growth. And we're constantly on the hunt, uh, but we're also very disciplined. So we will only buy stuff we really believe uh, can offer uh, good long-term growth at attractive margins. And we are interested in the, at the premium end of the spirits market. Mm. So that we have a pipeline of projects we're constantly looking at. Uh, for every one we buy, there are dozens we don't, uh, we reject. Uh, but we certainly would expect to continuing with bolt-on acquisitions of attractive brands. Ivan, real quick before we let you go, what's your go-to drink of choice? Johnny Walker Black on the rocks with a splash of club soda. All right, fair enough. I dig it. I can get on board with that. We'll leave it there. Yeah. Diageo CEO Ivan Menezes, good to see you. Stay safe. We'll talk to you soon. Great to see you. Thank you. We've got Albertson CEO Vivek Sankaran joining us today, along with Yahoo Finance's Julia LaRoche. Vivek, it's great to talk to you today. It's certainly a very strong quarter. I'd love to start with big picture here, because we are we have been talking to a lot of executives about where things stand in the recovery picture. When you look at your overall business, um, how optimistic are you about the growth being able to be sustained? Akiko, um, first, great to be here. I feel very positive about what I'm seeing out there. Number one, we have a strong consumer and you, you've heard about the savings and the macros, but I see it in our business because people haven't traded down, still consuming better meat and quality, premium wines, spending money on discretionary items like flowers. Uh, so I think we have a strong consumer. The other thing I'm seeing is that uh, I think people are still eating more at home. Uh, people are working at home, so you tend to eat more at home when you do that. Uh, and some of the habits that we gained during the pandemic, learning to cook at home, I think that's sustained itself. So we feel positive about the outlook on our business. You know, Vivek, it's interesting. I, I heard you talk about this uh, thesis, this hypothesis that you have about the continued uh, work from home. Let's start to explore that. And you're mentioning more people uh, kind of 
continue to cook from home. Do you think these are long-term trends that we'll see over the next few years? We'd love to kind of explore that further with you. Yeah, Julia, I, th let me separate the trends. One is more working, for, working from home. Um, I think you're seeing a lot of companies getting to some kind of a hybrid model, three days at work, two days at home. And remember, every single day at home is substantial, a substantial shift in consumption from restaurants to e eating a breakfast and a lunch at home. Two out of 21 meals, that's literally 10% of the consumption that could move over to, uh, to, uh, st to purchase from stores. So I think that, that I think has a much, that has long lasting potential because Technology is just getting better and enabling things like what we're doing right now. Um, the cooking at home, I, I'm not sure how long that will, that will sustain itself, but people have invested in more capabilities in, in, in things at home too, and they've become familiar with cooking at home. So I think that will last certainly through this year, and I, I, I'm not sure how long past that, but the first one is a very powerful force. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when we think about Albertsons, obviously last year it was a lot of those stocking up during the pandemic, a lot of big trips. But I think one of the things that's been quite notable, if I look, I'm looking at your release here, is the digital sales were sustained and on a two year stacked basis, 276% increase. How important is that digital consumer? I'm trying to understand in terms of are they making more trips? Do they, I'm putting in more orders? Do they get bigger baskets? How important is that consumer and what's kind of the big thing you have to overcome to bring more into that digital flywheel? Uh, Julia, the, the dig if I parse out the digital sales, even though they were flat to last year, if you look at the digital trips, they were up even over last year. We had a huge spike in quarter one and the number of digital transactions we had this year were on top of that. Uh, what we saw was a decrease in baskets because people were doing less of a stock up. Uh, from from last year, which is understandable because there was uh, pe people have more comfort that product is available. Digital sales are incredibly important. The reason we like that, the uh, first is we want to give consumers what what's important to them. But when you engage somebody digitally, you get more information about them, and when you get more information, you can personalize things for them. So the digital engagement allows us. It's a nice reinforcing cycle to give things that are more relevant to that consumer. So we like that. From a challenge standpoint, it, it's really about getting people, more and more people to engage um, and get comfortable with it. Uh, and for the business itself, at least today, it, it's not as profitable as the in-store sales, but it's truly incremental. And we've got plenty of things we're doing to make sure that the business is going to be profitable in the future. So we're excited about digital sales uh, on, a, on a total basis. Yeah, Vivek, I think that's the main question. It's smart for investors to be looking over that two-year stack rather than just last year. As to your point, there was a lot of stocking up going on back there. But you guys up sales guidance for that kind of two-year stack, uh, you know, 11 to 12 percent, prior guidance 9 to 11. Uh, but when you talk about that and margins around digital sales, you know, that was down. And so kind of digging into that as you move forward, if digital sales do hold up, you even heard from Visa talking about how much those purchases have become quite sticky for consumers moving out of the yes. pandemic. I mean, what are your expectations for uh, gross profit margin? If it was 29.1% this quarter, moving forward, digital sales holding up, do you expect it to continue to move down? Yeah, yeah. so we, we want the digital sales to move up. Yes, the, a digital transaction by itself is uh, less profitable than a store transaction, which is okay because some of those sales, if I take customer point of view, the people who shop both digital and store spend a lot more with us and are very, very profitable. So, so we like that uh, combination. From a gross margin standpoint itself, you know, we, we always like to think of having many initiatives that we call gross margin tailwinds. And, and those could be operational initiatives like managing shrink, reducing cost of goods, supply chains that are continuing to reinforce the gross margin that we can use for digital sales growth, we can use it for optimizing pricing, et cetera. So we like that virtuous cycle of driving these, uh, this productivity to put it back in there. And so that helps us. In the long run though, I want to emphasize, there's a lot of things that we are doing that will continue to improve the profitability of digital sales. Um, not just operationally, but if, when you think about having a digital uh, business that's at scale, you, it opens up other avenues like advertising revenues that we can, we will continue to bring more and more of that online which makes the math work once again for the total business. 
Albertson CEO Vivek Sankaran joining us there along with Yahoo Finance's Julia LaRoche. Our thanks to both of you. For much more on some of the regulatory headwinds that the platform is likely to face moving forward, let's bring in uh, Representative Sean Kasten from Illinois. And of course, uh, Congressman, uh, we have you on here because you've introduced this bill, uh, talk, uh, Trading Isn't a Game Act, to really look at the gamification that some would say um, has happened in investing as a result of the popularity of the Robinhood platform. Uh, you've been listening to the CFO, Jason Warnick, there talking about his platform. What concerns do you have as you continue to see this grow? Well, so I have a lot of concerns, and I think I mean I think you heard the CFO say it. He said that we are a tech company first, and that's pretty clear. But you know, we have a responsibility as 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 legislators to protect investors. And you know, I first became aware of this back in in June of 2020 when Alex Kearns um, in Naperville, a city in my district, took his own life after his Robinhood account showed that he had um, lost over seven hundred thousand dollars. He had seven thousand dollars to his name. And in the course of the conversations with his family and digging in, came to appreciate that this is a business that at core has no economic interest in creating value for investors. It makes money by getting you to come to their site, by using the tricks that you know Facebook and YouTube and these other social media companies use to get you addicted and churn, keep spending money, and then makes money on the backside as a proportion of how much money the, the market makers make on the back end. So they have an economic incentive to bring in money that is as uninformed as possible and sell it to people who are as sophisticated as possible. And you know, with respect for the CFO who's going to become very wealthy today, um, that's not a model that other broker dealers are emulating because other broker dealers have recognized that there are such massive conflicts of interest there. And you know, when you you know when you spend Spend as much time with a family who is grappling with the fact that they lost their son because their son got too addicted to this platform. And now the company is saying that we're a safety first company. Um, it's a bit disingenuous to put it bluntly. Yeah, and I mean, you famously during that congressional hearing kind of uh, called up the Robin Hood customer line there and it lasted 12 seconds and then went, uh, you know, basically ended uh, the message. They've invested more in their customer service since then, uh, promised to do better on that front. The gamification piece of all this, though, is a little interesting because it's kind of difficult to, uh, they've also reined that in too, but it's difficult to kind of identify what is gamification, how it differs from the other uh, brokerages out there who, you know, to be fair, have also emulated payment for order flow. They, there are a number of people doing that now. Um, but I mean, to you, which one's more important? And I know it's not necessarily an either or here, but it sounds like from regulators really focusing on payment for order flow, not just Robinhood, but across the board seems to be more pressing at the moment. Well, you know, with, with the and I'd encourage you, we actually had a really, really interesting, very bipartisan markup yesterday on financial services talking about this whole slew of issues. And you can't really separate the one from the other. You know, there's there's a value, I, I think, for payment for order flow, particularly for small, very illiquid commodities. But there's a tension for a company that has an obligation to look out for the best interests of its investors if your only money is coming from payment for order flow. And when you staple that to these gamification features that are giving you essentially these little endorphin surges in your brain as you get drawn into higher margin products. So, you know, so they've been pushing people, if you get into equities, it's really easy to click a button and then you can be drawn into options where they're making three times as much per trade on those options. Really good for Robinhood, really good for their investors, really good for the downstream market makers like Citadel really bad for the Alex Kearns of the world. And in the discussion we had yesterday, and, and we haven't even grappled with all this, we had this conversation yesterday that there's a whole separate issue that the tools that these companies are using, these psychological nudges, are tools that Silicon Valley has developed for, you know, Farmville and Candy Crush. And, you know, my own daughter plays a lot of SimCity, um, um, if I'm getting that right, and, you know, gets very excited about how many peas she has grown and, and, you know, these imaginary currencies. And if she wastes her time and loses imaginary money, okay, it's, uh, you know, it's fine. But when you're using those same tools to cause people to lose their real wealth or to put their mm. real wealth at the risk of someone else, that's a problem that we've got to address. Yeah, Congressman, I thought it was interesting that Jason Warnick, the CFO there, said that 
that Robinhood is a tech company first, and most would argue that it's fintech, not in the financial element comes before the technology. But, uh, you know, they, they have famously said that our platform has democratized investing. Um, they have repeated that on the roadshow. And to a certain point, you could argue that that has been true. It has brought in so many retail investors into the fold onto their platform. Um, can you have both tracks here where you've got easy access to investing, but also have the safeguards in place? Or does that easy access inherently come with the risk that you've already highlighted? Well, in, in, you know, look, I think the the history of financial regulation going back to, you know, early investors and, in, you know, in ships on the on the British coasts um, um, is this tension that you can, if everybody has access to capital markets, then we have to spend a lot of time making sure that we protect a lot of people. And there's always a tension between, you know, democratization of capital market access and protecting those investors. And the folks who want access to investor wealth are obviously always going to cheer much louder for democratization of capital. And the folks who are looking out for those investors are always going to cheer louder for investor protection. And we're in a democracy, right? That's a healthy tension. But I, in general, am always leery of someone who is absolutist about either of those extremes. Congressman Sean Kasten from Illinois, it's great to have you on today. Really appreciate the time. My pleasure. Thank you. I want to get back to the big story of the day, and that's that Robinhood IPO. Let's bring in Rodrigo Racuna, CFO at a Prime Trust. So, Rodrigo, um, right now I'm looking at Robinhood off about 5%. We know it opened flat and was priced at the low end of the range. What do you make of this tepid demand that Robinhood is being met with? You know, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for having me here. Um, I think the valuation and the growth that Robinhood has really is systemic of the user stories that it's been able to generate within the market. Um, I remember when I first actually made my very first trade within the market back in 2015, I downloaded Robinhood. I used it. I thought the fact that it was simple, it was a mobile first experience. They had fee-free trading. It was, they had fractionalized shares. It was very, very accessible. And I think the fact that the market is down is not really indicative of the long-term prospects that the company has. They've grown from that $11.7 billion valuation up and you know it's the first day of trading. I don't think it's that big of a deal. So Rodrigo, just continuing this point there on demand, uh, Robinhood, you know, pretty famously and also very uniquely came out and said that they would leave actually a little bit more than a third, 35% of their shares to those retail investors. You were obviously able to get in on that IPO if you have the Robin Hood app. And yet we saw retail investors only took up about 25%, the low end of the range that they had allocated for some of those retail investors. What does that say? that perhaps Robinhood users aren't interested in getting in on the Robinhood IPO? I think the headline here is not whether the price goes up or the price goes down. I think what really matters here is that Robinhood is following the trend of the most innovative asset classes in the market, such as Bitcoin, where they go to retail investors first. And they, yes, they'd allocated that 35%. But the fact is, is that they are giving retail investors a much bigger bite of the apple or, you know, in, in other cases, in other assets, they're going and giving the entire bite of the apple ahead of institutional investors. And that's meaningful because that gives you a sense of not needing to be a financial elite in order to get some of the most portfolio defining assets within your reach. And I think that's a huge win for investors. The 25 percent is an indicative of that. But what about some of the real concerns that uh, in investors, large and small, might have about Robinhood? I'm just going to tick through a, a couple of them here. Uh, an unsustainable form of revenue. You mentioned cryptocurrency a minute ago. Robinhood raked in roughly $30 million during the first quarter, thanks to trading of the joke cryptocurrency, Dogecoin, which we've seen drop like a rock. And more than 80% of its first quarter revenue came from payment order flows. And that's sending its customers orders to those high-speed trading firms, which I guess allows it to offer the zero uh, income, um, zero commission uh, trading. Aren't those real concerns going forward for the growth of Robinhood? 
I think anytime you enter in, into an investment, it's buyer beware. You need to have your own education in terms of the risks that you have. But with regards to the crypto market, Prime, you know, here at Prime Trust, we're one of the world's largest fintech infrastructure providers, and a company like uh, like Robinhood would be a perfect client. We power huge portions of the market, and we're all over the crypto market. We just closed a sixty-four million dollars Series A, and the fact is that Robinhood is IPOing, and they're here because, in large part, the crypto market. So I think it's nothing to really be that concerned about because the market is moving more towards crypto driven companies. On the regulatory side, from a payment for order flow standpoint, let's take a step back and, de and define payment for order flow, right? It just means that someone's paying for your trade, but innovation has consistently at times outpaced regulation. And where companies such as Uber or Lyft push the regulatory boundary, Robinhood is doing the same thing. And so I think much like here at Prime Trust, where we're hiring former regulators from the SEC, FINRA, OCC, et cetera, Robinhood is doing the same thing. They just hired the a former chairman of the SEC to lead their legal team, from my understanding. And I think that is a bullseye point on the strategy that they're ultimately taking. Work with your regulators, bring regulators into the company to address these concerns and get ahead. Don't make regulate regulators um, not a partner, but in fact, bring them into the fold on, on your mission. And I think that's really valuable for them. Uh, now, Rodrigo, or our colleagues in the 11 to 1 p.m. hour were, had a chance to, to talk with Robinhood CFO Jason Warnick. Let's just take a quick listen to what he had to say a little bit earlier. We're a tech company first. Uh, and we're incredibly lean. We just have a little over 2,000 employees and they've accomplished and built so much in these first six years. You know, and I think that uh, by using technology and innovation, we'll be able to continue to disrupt, uh, you know, the, uh, the financial system in a way that's really positive for broad retail participation. And of course, Robinhood went and gamified investing. And of course, as a result, has been incredibly popular with millennials and Gen Zers and just younger investors. I'm curious to know, however, about Robinhood's competition, some of those bigger firms like a Fidelity or a Schwab, a TD Ameritrade. If you think that they at all have an opportunity, especially if they capitalize on some of the tech, to really take some of that market share away from Robinhood. I think the, the whole payment for order flow model is pretty commoditized. And um, Schwab, E-Trade, et cetera, um, they've followed Robinhood's lead. Where Robinhood can't depend on that for its future growth, uh, it needs to continue innovating. And I think them going down the route of having one platform, one app, and one experience is going to continue to outpace competitors within the market. And that's that much of a challenge to the competitors that are coming after them. They need to, I think, follow suit because that's what's meaningful to the market today. All right, Rodrigo Vicuña, CFO at Prime Trust. Thanks so much for joining us on Robin Hood's Big Day. I want to continue this conversation here now. We're joined by Heather Boucher, member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Heather, great to have you here with us. So let's just start with that infrastructure package now that we are seeing some of that movement. Now, it has been trimmed and scaled back as we've gotten this sort of bipartisan package cobbled together. I'm curious to know if you think that perhaps this deal now might be a little uh, too little, if they might have trimmed a little bit too much. We've seen some criticisms from some of the more progressive members of the Democratic Party. I'm thinking of AOC right now who have actually criticized some of these movements uh, backwards in the package. Well, here's the thing. This is an historic investment in America's future, in our economy, in infrastructure, all across our economy. So I think this is a really exciting development. It is really wonderful to see this bipartisanship emerging out of the Senate on these issues that are so critical to American families, to American businesses. So it's an historic, uh, investment in transportation and transit. It's um, it's an historic investment in bridges. We're going to make sure that we get the leaded pipes out of the water system going into people's homes all across the United States. That is absolutely incredibly important. There is no amount of lead in the water that is safe for children. So that is super important. 
and we are making progress on some of the president's um, priorities in terms of climate and um, equity issues with the um, uh, investments that will create electric vehicle charging stations all across the United States. And um, also this really important investment to clean up the Superfund sites, the, the polluted sites across America, which of course disproportionately affect low-income communities next to them, uh, t t which tend to be disproportionate communities of color. So there is a lot in here that is very important for families, for businesses, for our economy. You certainly did tick through a, a number of really important issues that need to be dealt with, Heather, and, and have needed to be dealt with for quite some time. But as Kristen said, this is a slimmed down version. We started out with an infrastructure bill that was $3.2 trillion. We now have one at around a trillion dollars. We still have to pay for it. Can you go through some of the ways that the Biden administration hopes to do that? Well, in terms of the pay fors, there's a few big ticket items. One is you know, now that we've had the American Rescue Plan out there for a while, um, there's just, there are some places where there are monies that um, uh, where the cost was overestimated. And so without in any way, shape or form um, putting at risk our COVID attempts, uh, you know, the attempts to, to get the virus under control and the vaccine out and everything, there's additional money there that we'll be able to tap into as a part of this deal. So that is going to be some of the pay for. There's also going to be some corporate user fees. And then, of course, you know, one of the things about this legislation is that it is going to boost economic growth. And so um, the Senate has agreed to allow that uh, increase, that macroeconomic boost, and the increase in revenues that will come out of this boost to the economy to be counted as part of the pay fors. So certainly there's they have spent a lot of time working on that piece of the puzzle. Um, but I think that this is a good package. And you know, remember, it is part, um, it is one part of the two-pronged approach that the president has been working on. So this historic and, and really important bipartisan deal, and um, at the same time, working closely with, um, with Democrats on um, what's called the budget reconciliation, which has the other aspects of the Build Back Better agenda included there as well. So I want to ask about some other uh, parts of the White House's agenda. And part of that is human infrastructure, really building that up, expanding some tax credits to help folks take care of children or aging and elderly parents. I I'm curious to know if you are at all concerned that perhaps that human infrastructure package might really be left behind as we move forward more on that physical infrastructure bill. Well, you know, I listen to the president talk about these issues all the time, and I have seen the incredible work that my colleagues all across the White House and the administration have been doing to make sure that we are both attentive to the physical infrastructure that's embedded in this bipartisan bill, as well as the human infrastructure pieces. So the president has given speeches in recent days where he's talked about the importance of investing in home health aids, making sure that families with a disabled loved one or an aging loved one have access to the home health care that they need so they can stay in their homes and have a qualified worker who's paid a living wage come and help them and care for them. Um, we've also heard the president continue to talk about the important um, issues around childcare, universal pre-K, community college, um, school nutrition, um, as well as paid family medical leave. And, you know, this has always been a two-pronged approach. You know, during the campaign, the president laid out in three separate speeches his broad Build Back Better agenda, focusing on supply chains, focusing on addressing climate and infrastructure, and the human, the caring infrastructure pieces that are so necessary for our economy. And that continues to be the goal and the work that, that he's focused on each and every day. All right, we're going to have to leave that there. Heather Boucher, member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, thanks so much for joining us. Let's bring in the CEO of Traeger. We've got Jeremy Andrus joining us from the Stock Exchange, as well as Yahoo Finance's Brian Sazi. Jeremy, it's good to talk to you today. Congratulations on the IPO. It's not often that we talk about dueling IPOs between grill makers, but you're the first one out of the gate. You've got Weber on deck here in what feels like a crowded space, but really, really strong sales. Um, what sets Traeger apart from the competition? Yeah, look, uh, Traeger is, is an innovative brand. We're a disruptor. We're bringing a whole new experience to home cooking. It's a wood-fired grill. It's a, it's a wood pellet grill. And 
it just makes people better at cooking. The passion that people feel when they own a Traeger is unlike anything I've ever seen. So we're a disruptor and uh, we're, we're an underdog, but we're bringing a better consumer experience and the market's responding really well. We're, we're, we're growing like crazy. Jeremy, I did get the sense reading up on, on Traeger and the history of the company, you are a disruptor and it is a different company compared to some of your competitors. Tell our, our viewers and the investors on the platform, what is Traeger Independence Day and why do you celebrate it? <laughs> Tra Traeger Independence Day, boy, um, it's a holiday around Traeger. It is, uh, we, we celebrate uh, the moment that we bought this brand and it was a 27 year old brand when we acquired it and we had the ability to rebuild it, to rebuild the team, to rebuild the culture and really take these wonderful bones, a heritage in this business and make it new and infuse technology and, and to really be the disruptor. And it's fun, it's a, it's, it's a holiday and, and the community rallies around it. The Traeger hood loves it. Yeah, and you look at the revenue there at Traeger, uh, Jeremy. You know, I bought a wood pellet grill in lockdown because I was bored, needed a new hobby. I smoked some meats, uh, and your revenue was up 50% last year. I wonder how you see that continuing in the future, though. If we are to reopen, people get back to work, maybe less time for hobbies. Uh, and, you know, how you stack up against competitors. I did not buy a Traeger grill, but I have used the wood for the wood pellet grill from Traeger. So talk to me about uh, that and the subscription side, too. Yeah, first of all, uh, Tra Tra Traeger's been growing for many years pre-pandemic. From 2015 to 2019, we grew top line at a 30% CAGR. And so we've been taking share and we're doing it because we've got this better product experience. There's no question that during the pandemic, home cooking accelerated. And if you're to look at outdoor recreation or you know Peloton and home fitness, there are some consumer behaviors that, that consumers found and they're sticky. And we think home cooking is one of those. 70% of Americans said they plan to cook as much, if not more, post-pandemic. 35% of Americans say they found a new hobby in cooking. And so we were a growth business heading into, we've been taking share. We are literally in, in 2 million homes. That's 3% of American homes that own, that own a grill. And so we've always been a growth story it was nice to have the ability to really tell our story and like really bring some joy during uh, kind of the gloomy days of the pandemic and people really rallied around the brand. So we expect to continue to grow. We are a 20% plus top line grower over the long term and we feel really good about our position in the market. Jeremy, five years from now, what is the Traeger grill doing then as opposed to now? And is it selling at a higher price point than your average price point today at about 140 bucks? Yeah, look, so, so our average price point is about $850 at retail. So that, that's two and a half times the average selling price of a grill. And I think it's important to note that Traeger is not, Traeger's not a grill business. It is an integrated home cooking platform. The grill is, of course, is an important part. It's an innovation and we just keep making it better. And our consumers keep telling us they are willing to pay more for more innovation. But we've got this, this protected innovation in a connected wood pellet grill. And so the innovation in what we're doing is not just the consumer durable, it is a connected platform. It's connecting the grill to the cloud, to a phone. It makes it easier to use. And it really provides all of the content that leads someone in this cooking journey. I mean, like, like myself, I was terrible at cooking eight years ago. I went out and I bought a Traeger and I became great at cooking. So everything we're doing is around the innovation and technology, but notably this connected and content experience that inspires people. You know, what are they going to cook? How are they going to cook it? Where are they going to buy the ingredients? You know, it's all, it's all of the how-to that makes someone great. And so I think that's an important differentiator. We don't just sell bent and welded steel. We are creating experiences because of the entire platform. Well, Jeremy, I think you may have convinced me to buy a Traeger. If it's gonna improve and my cooking, that may be my last ticket, the last 100 option. 100% it will, I guarantee it. <laughs>
Jeremy Andrus, that's the CEO of Trigger. And our thanks to Brian Sazi as well for joining in on the conversation.